Um, my name is Sue Kearns. I'm a faculty member in the Division of Public Behavioral Health and Justice Policy at the University of Washington. And it's really my pleasure to welcome everybody to our kickoff lecture for the 2013-14 year. Uh, we're going to get to here. This is a very popular lecture by Dr. Terry Lee, and so I'll introduce him in just a moment. But I wanted to just um, highlight that we have an amazing lineup of people for the rest of the year already here. Lucy, you could fill us in on your on your title, <laughs> right? But everybody else's titles are up here, um, so you can see the range of different topics that are going to be covered through this series. We've tried to um, simultaneously provide additional opportunities for specific information about content material, while also providing a few more opportunities to broaden what we're trying to do with this lecture series, which includes we have a uh, um, someone coming in from. Uh, from Washington State, Brittany Rhodes, to talk about prevention and what's going on with prevention in Washington State. Um, Eric Bruns, who's sitting here, is also going to be giving a talk on um, kind of more of a policy level, things that are happening here in Washington as well. And so just having an opportunity to, to broaden out while also going deep. So we hope that the whole course series will be a nice, uh, provide just a nice picture of different things that are happening here and and get under the hood a little bit with some of the different evidence-based treatment approaches we've at, we've been really responsive to hopefully we've been responsive hopefully you'll agree we've been responsive to the feedback that you've given us on the um on the the feedback forms on the types of talks that you'd like to see included in the future so you'll see for example we have an, a lecture on autism that was something that was really uh, requested a lot last year. So really trying to build in and be responsive to what the audience is interested in hearing about and finding content experts in that area. So without further ado, I am going to introduce Terry Lee, Dr. Lee. He's an assistant professor and child and adolescent psychiatrist in the Division of Public Behavioral Health and Justice Policy. Um, he provides psychiatric services for youth in King County Juvenile Detention and at the Washington State Juvenile Rehabilitation Administration and um, also King County Family Integrated Transitions Program, which is a program for children who are transitioning from secure incarceration back out into the community. His interests include the development and dissemination of evidence-based practices and effective treatments for high needs youth, including especially, as you might tell from his bio, the juvenile justice and child welfare system. So thank you, Terry. We're li looking forward to your talk. All right, thanks, Updates Sue. on ADHD. All right, thanks. Uh, so um, there's going to be on ADHD. I was just wondering for the uh, people in the audience, do you, um, what do you feel like your baseline knowledge of ADHD is? I'm just going to ask people to raise hands. I'm going to say high, low, medium. Okay, so uh, low. No. <laughs> high, <laughs> medium. Okay, did I stage this right? Okay, so <laughs> this is the talk I set up. So this is an update. So I'm, I'm trying to highlight kind of the latest findings. So these are the things we're going to talk about, recognizing ADHD, some characteristics of it, um, discuss the course of ADHD, the pros and cons of treatment, and what goes into parent decision making. Um, some more research on this recently. So uh, DSM-5 came out. Uh, a few things changed on ADHD. But the main emphasis is the same as far as the symptoms, the clusters of symptoms. So um, right now on DSM, uh, ADHD is conceptualized as a disorder of, of uh, inattention, distractibility, hyperactivity, and impulsivity. Um, some things that changed is that uh, uh, it's recognized that some of the symptoms go away as you get older. So adolescents and adults need um, fewer criteria to make the diagnosis. Uh, in addition, um, just the age of onset of symptoms was raised. That, that was really done more for um, uh, just because people's memories aren't always good. That, that was the idea. Um, Usually, the, the prevalence of ADHD is cited as 3 to 5 percent. That's around the world. It's usually higher in the United States. I had an average of 6 to 8 percent. There's some studies actually as high as 10 or 15 percent of kids in the general population being diagnosed with ADHD in, in some communities. Um, let's see. And like everything else in child mental health, there's, there's both over-diagnosis or under-diagnosis. And we don't quite target the right kids, so these are two epidemiological studies, one showing that um, there were some kids that, that would benefit from medication but weren't on medication, and others that were on medication didn't clearly seem to have the disorder. Um, we know that girls are more likely to be underdiagnosed. Girls tend more to have the inattentive type without hyperactivity. 
girls tend not to have the destructive behavior in this result and end up not being referred. Um, just this is from the MTA study. Um, just ADHD, plain old ADHD is rare. So this is some, a large study that was done and only about 30% of the kids only had ADHD. Um, anyone think it's a scam? No, no doubters. So anyone who took the road, stood next to the road, rode their bike on the road should be aware that um, kids or uh, adults with ADHD and adolescents with ADHD are more likely to be in accidents, including car accidents. Um, as far as the etiology goes, again, we, we now have a pretty large body of evidence that uh, the brains of kids with ADHD is different than the brains of kids without ADHD. Okay, and I don't want to go over all these areas, but just know that, that this is being very well characterized now and it fits pretty well. What, what we find on neuroimaging correlates very well with what we know about those areas of the brain and, and what function there is. So the frontal lobes uh, really uh, they have a lot to do with executive functioning, so planning, inhibiting behavior, uh, things like that. Uh, some other research that's coming out is looking at reward and motivation processing. So this is also different in kids with ADHD, and, and there are actually some interventions targeting um, more concrete rewards. Um, and and this, this actually correlates with um, changes in behavior as well as changes uh, on brain imaging. Um, and then there are also, through these studies, several um, areas of the brain that will actually change with ADHD treatment. So this is a busy slide. Can you? Can you read this or not? Is it hard to see? The, the, it's just the same thing. I just thought I'd summarize some of, but this was a study summarizing some of the findings. This is a meta-analysis, so looking at these different regions, looking at studies in children and adults, gray matter, white matter, function, and changes on functional neuroimaging after treatment. So again, the idea is just not to go over each region of the brain, but um, that there are very consistent findings now in kids with ADHD versus kids without, and some reversals in, in with medication treatment. Does this make sense? Um, so I thought I'd show some pictures because um, uh, people say when you show a picture of the brain during a talk, people people like that. So <laughs> uh, yeah, the, uh, this isn't so much to emphasize the specific. Well, I guess we'll talk about some. So the and the frontal lobes and the temporal lobes are involved. Here, here's a problem-solving task. So you see the control. The kids without ADHD activate more parts of their brain in trying to solve a problem. Uh, this is just the baseline functioning. So uh, again, there's, there's a lot of research. This is a PET scan looking at uh, brain metabolism is just higher in kids without ADHD. And then here's an example then of um, lower activation in the red is increased activity with, with Adderall. And then um, and thinking of the ideology of ADHD, you could think of some kids as having problems with um, inhibiting behavior and um, um, controlling hyperactivity and, and impulses, in part just as a result of uh, uh, immaturity in their brain, that, that it's just that the kids are more delayed in uh, developing those areas of the brain. And so this is supposed to illustrate that. So the idea here is that uh, at the end, the brains are about the same as far as the, the um, levels of activity in the areas of the brain. But the kid with ADHD or the kids with ADHD in this population were just slower to, to mature. Um, so, that, so this is why when it comes to treatment, um, you know, most kids start treatment at about seven or eight years old. Um, I recommend at least once a year in elementary school to try going off medication because you might have a kid in this category that at some point they'll, they'll outgrow the need for medication. All right, uh, genetics plays a role. And then the other kinds of known causes don't account for a lot, but any kind of insult to the brain or the CNS system can result in ADHD symptoms. Um, so food coloring, you were here last time when this came up. <laughs> so uh, we'll talk a little bit around the treatment side, but uh, the, not enough studies have really been done. A lot of studies have been done on kids without ADHD. So, so just taking typically developing kids and then giving them concoctions of food coloring or sugar can sometimes result in increased 
activity. Now that's, that's a little different than saying that if, if we took that out, then the kids who have clinical symptoms would, would go into the non-clinical range. I mean, there are groups of kids like this, but it's not clear from the studies what percentage of the kids with ADHD fall into that category. Um, although people have tried to estimate this. We'll talk about this at the end. Any questions about this? I feel I had so many last time that uh, I want to be prepared. <laughs> All right. Um, then the course, uh, again, we don't have great research, but you could think of some chunk of kids as continuing to have ADHD symptoms into adolescence and then into adulthood. So we estimate about 60 to 80 percent or so. So if you think the rate is about 6 to 8 percent in kids, um, with National Comorbidity Study of Adults, the rate in adults was about 4.4 percent. Um, and that was using the old criteria, so it might be a little bit higher than that now. Okay, but again, the key is some group of kids, probably a high percentage of kids, will continue to have symptoms into adulthood. Um, so when you th look at the, uh, the symptoms of inattentiveness and impulsivity and hyperactivity, uh, if you have those things, a lot, a lot of bad things can subsequently happen. So we see things like schools, uh, problems with school, disruptive behavior, peer rejection. Um, when you don't do well in school, when you're disruptive in school, there's, there's other research. Just, just looking at teacher behavior then changes, such that uh, teachers tend to be more, more punitive and do less teaching, do so, less social and academic teaching, and less, less recognized positive behavior on the part of the kid. So this can set you up for a cascade of negative behaviors. This is why, oh, and then uh, again, there's a lot of research, some old, some new, looking at um, parenting a kid with ADHD can be very stressful. Um, and we'll, we'll actually see an example of this. Uh, and then as far as adult talk comes again, but potentially you can get bad things like substance use and criminal behavior and poor work performance. Um, so th this is where I think it, it's important to consider then the course that this is a chronic illness for, for many people and it's important to intervene as, as, um, as aggressively as, as the situation calls for. As far as making the diagnosis, um, this hasn't changed this much over time, or this hasn't changed much over time. So it's still based on a clinical interview of the kid, get information from the school, the teachers, the parents, uh, you want some ADHD scales, uh, you might want to order some other things, but um, it's, it's really based on a clinical interview. There's no blood test, there, there's no paper and pencil tests, um, just based on an interview. Um, no imaging in ADHD, so, so why do I mention this? <laughs> oh, okay, so the <laughs> I think last time people started yelling out about the Amman Clinic, people familiar with that? Yes, no. So, so this is um, a group in California that we're doing some uh, neuroimaging, something along the lines of what I was showing you before, but, but really offer this not as a research tool, but as a clinical tool. And it used to be $10,000, it's about $6,000 now, and actually there, there's a market, um, you know, if you have $1,000, $2,000, $3,000, $4,000, they'll, they'll find something they can do as far as testing. Um, and they, actually, the, the online clinic is doing pretty well. They're, they're now in Bellevue, so, so you don't have to fly down to California anymore. There's a branch up here. So it's really quite a bit of growth. But um, again, the professional organization that I belong to, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, has been clear that, that it's not really useful in making a diagnosis, nor is it useful in um, uh, telling you what medication you should try. Yes, there's a question? The, the question is, what's the name of the clinic? Yeah. It's, it's the Amen Clinic, A-M-E-N, Amen, yeah. Yes? Uh, so. Mm -hmm. Sure, so, so the question is, um, why is it not useful diagnostically? Um, and that, uh, that's because this, it's still a research tool in that it, the specificity so, so you could get other things that, that could cause um, a similar profile uh, for any individual kid. And then uh, it's, it's not, um, the, there's a cost associated with it too. And uh, it, it's really no better than um, doing a clinical evaluation. Okay. Now, if you had unlimited resources, I mean, that, that's fine. If you have time and resource, that, 
may fi be fine to do, but, but really it would be the best use of resources to just do a clinical eval and then try the different medications. Also, the, the um, we'll talk later how people, parents, people tend to be uncomfortable with prescribing medication. Um, the Amen clinic actually uses a, a radioactive isotope to, to do their scans. Um, so you're exposing a kid to something like that as well. Yes? Can you, can you speak a little bit about how effective and how accurate the current diagnosis is um, when, you're, when you're going through the, the various surveys? I'd mm -hmm. imagine that sometimes if there's a teacher that's completing those that's really frustrated with a kid, those might not necessarily be as accurate. So just kind of curious about your perspective. Yeah, so again, it's, it's based, well, I guess everyone heard the question, uh, how accurate is it to, to do clinical interview? And that, that's not always the most reliable method either, but I, I think that um, by putting this all together, by getting input from multiple um, people who know the kid, then, then you can increase the reliability of your diet and the validity of, of your diagnosis. Um, I think most people don't want the kid to be on medication. Sometimes I think people worry that you know, the, the teacher is frustrated and may, may over-report symptoms, but, but that doesn't mean that you're just going by what the teacher says. And you can also just, I, I typically will talk to the teacher and get them to describe like what, what they see in the classroom and ask them to expand on um, what, what their concerns are. Um, and then in the case of an older kid, you, they'll, they'll have multiple classes, and so you'll get five or six different teacher reports. All right. uh, and you, you want uh, multiple reporters. You, uh, a psychiatrist definitely doesn't want to do this just based on how the kid looks in the room because they, they could be nervous and be afraid to move, or they may be nervous and move around, and that, that doesn't mean they do or don't have ADHD. Um, these are some of the rating scales that are used. It, again, you, you wouldn't use this just to make the diagnosis, but this can help support that as well as um, follow treatment response, like, like a medication trial or in, uh, some other kind of behavioral intervention. Uh, these are things that I would strongly consider <laughs> in many evaluations, including vision and um, hearing test. Then the other tests are more if, if there's some kind of uh, reason to, to order. Other, other kinds of um, cognitive and achievement tests. These are the ACAP recommendations, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry recommendations. Screen everyone for ADHD, interview the kid, the parent, and the school. Uh, if you don't know, need to order any other tests, if, if there's no medical history that's significant, um, you should only order further psychological and neurological tests if there's some reason to suspect uh, neurological problem or some kind of learning disorder. Um, evaluate for comorbid disorders, which we saw were very common. Uh, you need a comprehensive treatment plan. Mild ADHD can be treated with medication or with behavior treatment alone. If it's uncomplicated ADHD, it could be treated with medication alone. Um, and then you need to assess the need for medication over time. So we're going to start with treatment. Yes. <laughs> they talking about doing this screening and how is that supposed to happen, especially since the recommendation says you should talk to the school, the parent, and the kid. I mean, and, and why screen everyone for ADHD <laughs> versus any other condition that might be in 5% right. of the population uh, since that's a pretty, uh, you know, that's a, quite an investment. Yeah, so good question. Um, I, I don't know if I quite agree with the recommendation to screen everyone. It may be uh, that every child that comes into a child psychiatrist's office should be screened. And pediatricians are trying to also look at universal screening, um, but, but usually more if you suspect something. I do think um, you, you don't want to miss it, so I, I think there should be a low threshold to screen since, since the outcomes can be so, so, so poor if it's untreated. Uh, and we have some effective treatments or some ineffective treatments, it would be important to not miss a problem that, that we could potentially help. I think that's thinking behind it, but yeah, I, I agree that it would be hard to screen the entire population, um, and it may not be practical. 
Right. Well, we're going to watch a video that touches on some of these things. This is um, th there was a, this is an older frontline special. I can't remember, but, but it's pretty old. But I think a lot of the um, a lot of the issues are are about are relevant today. And we're actually just going to look at one little bit. This is a kid named Robin. There are actually a series of kids and families that are featured. So what we'll, what we'll see is um, sort of Robin's story. He's a young man that didn't have good response to treatment. And then at the end of this, they'll, they'll summarize the treatment of some other kids. And so if you're interested in the other kids, you can watch the, uh, the video. I just punched in frontline ADHD and came up with this. All right. So I think this um, brings up some of the things I've been talking about. Um, we have reactions, a wide range of response to medication. Uh, the girl, Noel, actually was doing pretty poorly, so she's getting straight A's, but she was getting suspended and had all sorts of problems in school. Um, so again, you had a kid that didn't respond well to medication, or the kid with comorbid depression and ADHD that seemed to respond to, to treatment, was continuing treatment. A lot of family stress in Robin's case, um, and uh, the decision to go off on its own, which again is quite common in adolescence. Anything you know, people saw or? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Oh, right. So uh, the, the comment was there, was there were no behavioral interventions that were discussed. Um, so so they, they did show the psychologist that, that Robin was working with. And you know, they were doing some behavioral things as well that, that also didn't help. Um, with the kind of the path that, that he was on. But um, behavioral interventions um, are an important part of treatment, treating ADHD, well, especially the, the comorbidity that comes with it, usually the disruptive behavior and the, and the anxiety, um, or anxiety symptoms that can sometimes come. Um, but it is in there, like, <laughs> but you, we didn't see it in that clip. So, so the comment uh, or the question has to do with um, what, what about within our own country? How, uh, how do the rates of ADHD vary um, among different uh, ethnic groups? And um, I, I think also as part of that, uh, we, we need to look at socioeconomic groups. So um, uh, as, as far as um, family income goes, there's a bimodal distribution around who gets diagnosed with ADHD. So kids who come from families with high income that have access to, to uh, child psychiatrists or mental health clinicians uh, tend to get the diagnosis and be placed on medication. And then kids with low income also tend to um, be diagnosed with ADHD and placed on medication in part because they have access through Medicaid and mental health centers to child psychiatrists. Um, for the people, like even in this room with our insurance, you, you might actually find it hard to, to see a child psychiatrist very quickly, that they're, they're either very full or, or tend not to um, take insurance. Um, and then uh, as far as different ethnic groups, um, uh, in general, uh, minority groups tend to be underdiagnosed and not, not, um, not assessed for ADHD, not, um, not treated with medication, uh, I think. Often the problems are seen more as behavioral or, or the kid being willful, and, and there's not a consideration of, of um, ADHD. Okay. Is that another question? Yeah, I, I was just thinking about it in general, child welfare population, but children with ADHD, um, I didn't know if that had anything to do with or what your thoughts were about that, and also. If, um, if, if drug-exposed children tend to have, um, to have a higher diagnosis of um, ADHD as well. 
Okay, so the, the question had to do with kids in the child welfare system and an overdiagnosis of ADHD. Um, and then the second part had to do with drug exposed kids, and drug exposed in utero. So um, there's again a pretty good body of research showing the kids in the child welfare system are, are more likely to be placed on psychiatric medications and sometimes uh, at much higher rates. So just looking in general at, at psychiatric medications, just depending on where you are, um, uh, kids in foster care are about two to ten times more likely to be on psychiatric medications compared to other kids who qualify for Medicaid because of low, low family income. If you look at antipsychotic medication, including in our state, um, kids in the child welfare system are about seven more times um, in our state, and the national rate is about eight times more, more likely to be placed on antipsychotic medication compared to other kids um, who qualify for Medicaid because of low income. Um, so th there are some good reasons for that and some not so good reasons. I think um, if, if you look at the, why it might be appropriate that, that kids in the child welfare system are, are predisposed genetically, um, potentially to, to have more psychiatric problems in ADHD. Um, kids in uh, foster care, child welfare, uh, now have access to insurance. Like I was saying, <laughs> the Medicaid population does, does have actually better access to um, child psychiatrists than, say, say the, um, the people with just, just regular insurance. Um, in theory, there's universal, well, there is universal screening <laughs> in uh, child welfare. So again, you might pick it up more. Uh, the, there might be better advocacy. So you have a caseworker that's following up, that, that, that's their job to follow up. Um, see, those might be some of the, the good reasons. And then I, I think some of the not so great reasons why kids may end up on more medications because there, there could be ineffective advocacy for the kid. Um, there might be uh, uh, disjointed care. You know, that If kids move around, then, then there may be a lack of continuity in care. I think sometimes uh, people turn more to psychiatric medications instead of behavioral treatments to try to, to treat um, behavioral problems. Um, I think sometimes people hope that medication can stabilize a complex social situation. Um, I guess those are some of the reasons. Yeah, the, the effects of trauma, so that's part of the risk um, well, as well. So being traumatized or being the victim of abuse or neglect, um, just to involve you with the child welfare, welfare system and then being removed from the home can also be traumatic by itself and being, being separated from your attachment figures can, can also be very traumatic. So there are, there are a lot of good reasons and there's some not so good reasons to have increased rates of prescribing. Um, again, looking at child welfare, again, African-American youth, in the child welfare system are more likely to have unmet or undermet mental health need, just in general. And the kids who are the victims of neglect also tend not to get referred from mental health services, even though they, they are symptomatic in a, in a range that would call for referral to, to a mental health evaluation. Okay. Yeah. Maybe simple, similar behavioral um, issues for kids that have more PTSD symptoms based upon that trauma. And so there's some misdiagnosis and inappropriate treatment because it's a hypervigilance or a you know, response to the trauma they've experienced and not ADHD, although it can look similar to that. What are your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so the, the question had to do with um, mistaking trauma for ADHD or uh, some people like Judy Cohen would say mistaking ADHD for trauma. Um, can go either way. Uh, yeah, I, I think it's something to, to strongly consider that uh, are, are we seeing, because trauma seems to be able to manifest in many different ways, but uh, again, I, I would look to the, the core symptoms of inattention and distractibility to, to, to help try to sort some of that out. Um, it may not always be possible, but tr try to get a kid in a situation where they're feeling pretty safe and um, with a comfortable, it's been a fairly consistent setting. Again, this isn't always possible, but get them in that setting and then try to assess their ability to stay on task and pay attention and um, avoid distractibility, which I think is one of, I mean, I would say that's the most important symptom of ADHD is the distractibility and inattention, more so than hyperactivity or impulsivity. Okay. All right, so uh, treatment, stimulants for ADHD. Um, I guess I put this on a later slide, but stimulants or medications are like uh, Ritalin or Adderall or Concerta or 
um, by Vance, things like that. So th uh, th these are actually very well studied medications. Like, like we know more about this in child psychiatry than we know about anything. Um, and so there, th there have been hundreds of controlled trials, mostly in elementary school age kids, uh, but there's actually been a fair amount of research in adults. Uh, it, it really pales. I mean, most of the studies have been in elementary school age kids, but, but now we're looking at the entire age range. And in general, you, you get a pretty good treatment response. Um, uh, probably three-fourths of kids, and, and even higher, I would say, when, when you're really careful about making the diagnosis. A lot of child psychiatrists would say the response rate is closer to 85 or 90 percent. And in some of these other studies, it's because they, they, you didn't get a good diagnosis. Um, I'm going to talk about effect size. So just the important thing is that, that there's a formula, but um, these are the numbers that, that Cohen just set this up, like 0.2 is small, 0.5 is medium, 0.8 is large. Um, so in, in looking at different treatments, uh, so like in child mental health, just child mental health, not ADHD, um, people looked at like community treatment and um, um, like just evaluated like, like what's the average effect size of, a, of psychosocial treatments in, in the United States. So Eric Bruns, what would that be? <laughs> You're throwing everyone in the pot. Oh, everyone in the pot. In the real world? Yes, in the real world. Probably about 0.05. 0.05. <laughs> 0.05. Not 0 0.5, but 0 0.05. Yeah, so uh, people come up with about zero is, is about the average effect size. And the highest in the real world are about 0.3. So just, just keep this all in mind. Um, in looking at the core symptoms of ADHD then, impulsivity, hyperactivity, inattention, you, you get very large effect sizes with, with stimulants. Okay, so, so, so you don't see anything like this in mental health except for antipsychotics for people with schizophrenia. But if you look at like uh, antidepressants for depression, anxiety medications for anxiety, you know, it's, it's much, much lower than this. Uh, so just, just keep that in mind, that we have these very effective treatments for the core symptoms, but then you know, we, we talked about all these, these other sequelae of, um, of ADHD, the disruptive behavior, and, and then everything that comes with that. So a very common comorbidity is ADHD and disruptive behavior. This was a meta-analysis done, and so they, in this estimate, the, the effect of stimulants for, so I wasn't clear, for oppositional behavior, for kids with ADHD and oppositional behavior, the effect size for just stimulants alone was about 0.61. So, you know, that's pretty good if you're thinking averages uh, or, or the best typically is 0.3. And then psychosocial treatment. So, again, some of these were in laboratory or university settings was 0.66, which is, again, pretty good. Hard to treat problem. But really, combining the two gives you real large effect size. So, this is very important to know that uh, a family might choose to not place their, ch their child on medication, but they really should have a good understanding that. So really looking at, at quite a difference in, in potential outcome. And then when you look at the consequences of, of negative behavior, it, it really goes downhill pretty quickly. Does this make sense? Okay. Um, as far as other medication effects, so, so these are, again, more the core symptoms of on-task behavior. Uh, well, on-task behavior is, is one of the core symptoms. But then it, um, you, you can get these other outcomes um, that are are positive, so the teacher will think that you're doing better. The peer nominated rankings of social standing, so that this is asking the other kids in elementary school classroom uh, questions about their peers, like, like who do you most want to play with, who do you least want to play with, who's most likely to hit you, who, who, do, you want to, who do you want to work with um, at, at, during free time. And so kids with ADHD tend to score low on peer nominated rankings of social standing. And the kids, the peers themselves, can, can notice a difference. So they, they find the kid more, more likable when the kid is on medication. Um, and then, again, all these um, sort of executive functioning type of tasks. Uh, and you know, there, there's a fair amount of research showing that uh, caregiver stress and strain also decrease with medication treatment. Um, as far as the long-term effects, uh, the medication will continue to have effects on the core symptoms after, after a year or more. 
Um, no, tolerance does not develop. Um, and uh, th there's been a lot of concern over substance use disorders. Uh, it's a hard thing to study because we, we can't randomize kids for long periods of time on, on medication. So uh, we're really guessing based on um, the outcomes of kids who stay on or don't stay on medications. So at this point, the party line, and I, I think we can still do more research around this, the, the party line is um, st stimulants don't clearly increase or decrease future substance use disorders in kids with ADHD. Kids with ADHD are at increased risk for substance use disorders. There, there was some idea that they, they might have a protective effect if you avoid all the, all the negative consequences, but that, that just doesn't seem to, it's not clear that that's really the case. Um, and again, untreated ADHD is, is, um, it is really a risk for, for future substance use disorders just, just by the nature of, of having destructive behavior and then socializing with anti, um, negative peers and substance using peers. Yeah, is there a question? Sorry for all these questions. Was there anything um, on that about uh, children who, again, have been drug exposed? Oh. Um, so have Sorry, children who that drug question. exposed? <laughs> so in general, um, uh, as I said earlier, any kind of CNS insult uh, can cause symptoms that look like ADHD, uh, including intrauterine exposure to alcohol or, or other drugs. And, and so that, that is a known cause of ADHD. Um, kids uh, with fetal alcohol syndrome um, still respond best to stimulants, but the response rate isn't as high as kids with um, other causes or unknown causes of ADHD. I'm sorry. So just for clarification, I mean, for no. kids that were more likely to, um, you know, end up being substance abusers later on. Um, oh, it's just uh, the fact of being exposed in utero to... Is, well... So I think I read a study, and I'm, it's been a while back, that suggested that giving children uh, Ritalin or Adderall is not advisable for kids who have been drug exposed because that will that could increase their likelihood of you know substance abuse because of their pre-exposure to mm. Drugs yeah, I, I believe there could have been such a study published or even a series, but, but I, I would say that the risk is more of untreated ADHD. Um, stimulants really are the best medications, and, and I, I would think that, um, um, or to, just offering the best treatment will result in the best outcomes. I, I don't, the, the idea of like sensitizing a kid or, or just by uh, being sensitized in utero and then um, having that, I guess, uh, actualized by being exposed to medication. I, I don't think there's any evidence to support that. I might go look into that a little bit more, but we, we do treat kids with a, um, fetal alcohol syndrome, for instance, with, um, with stimulant medications, and it, yeah, it seems to work the best and um, is most helpful for the disruptive behavior as well. Um, if you just look at, I mean, there, there have been some studies published recently around um, even uh, kids whose who's, um, mothers smoked while they were pregnant, and then looking at kids either who were raised by other people or, or by their families, and they, they seem to have the same rates of substance use disorders later on in life. So, so just, just the fact of smoking cigarettes itself is, is a large risk for future behavior problems. Uh, so as far as the, um, so, so this is a meta-analysis that was done recently, um, looking at long-term long studies, long-term being more than two years and somewhere up to, to 10 years, um, and looking at treatment versus non-treatment, looking at um, different kinds of psychosocial outcomes. And we'll, I think I have it on this side, so, so we'll talk about what, what some of those are. But in general, again, just, just having ADHD puts you at risk to have more, more functional problems later in life. If you treat with medication, that, that will decrease some of the risks, but, but will not make the risk go away completely. Um, yes? Uh, for all of this, inattentive type ADHD responds in the same manner to combined type or hyperactive type? You, you mean as far as medication? Goes? Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it's hard to tease apart some of that. 
I, I do think um, the, the, prim uh, the inattentive symptoms do respond to, to medication. And it's, again, to me, the, that's really the, the most central symptom of, of ADHD, and it responds very well to medication. Um, in general, not having the disruptive behavior will be associated with better long-term outcomes. So, so these are some of the psychosocial outcomes that have been looked at, and these are studies of more than two years. So, whoops. So things like us, actually, the individual self-esteem and social functioning, very, very robust findings there. That, that clearly, that's improved. Yeah, that's a very consistent improvement. Academic outcomes is also very consistent. Um, I think with these, well, actually, driving is very <laughs> inconsistent, but I think occupation and behavior, and I could have substance use disorders there too, that, that doesn't respond quite as well. I, th I think those are higher order behaviors, they're more complex, and I think we'd all agree that, that you would really need more than a medication to try to head off those things or to try to improve those things. I mean, something like occupation, even people without ADHD, you know, occupation can, can be an issue, or employment can be an issue. Um, This is a very interesting study. So this was published last year in the New England Journal of Medicine. So this is a Swedish study. Who else but someone like the Swedes could do a study like this. So these are adults with ADHD. They were followed for three years. So they had access to the pharmacy records, since there's a universal health program. Uh, they had access to the criminal records. And they looked at um, criminal behaviors defined by convictions. Uh, as it related to compliance with ADHD medication. And so what they found is that when these adult uh, persons with ADHD were taking medication, there was a 32% reduction in criminality for males and an over 40% reduction in criminality for females. Quite remarkable, huh? And then in case you think, well, they're just being compliant with the medications, they're at a compliant point in their life, they looked at SSRIs, which don't treat ADHD, but treat anxiety and depression. Compliance with SSRIs were not associated with any reduction in criminality. Again, so some pretty strong evidence in support of uh, the effects of medication and um, what it can do for behavior. Questions about that? Uh, as far as side effects go, uh, these, again, are fairly stable. I mean, as far as what we know, it hasn't changed over time. The substance use, we're, we're still trying to tease out. But um, as far as any, uh, well, starting with short-term side effects, uh, a lot of kids who respond to medication will have either sleep problems or appetite suppression or both. I'd say about two-thirds or more will have one or the other or both. So we, we do need to manage those side effects. Um, some, some kids do have to stop. The medication because we're unable to, to manage the appetite suppression. Um, and then I, I think one of the most serious, or the most serious long-term, serious, I guess one of the most impactful long-term side effects is a, a decrease in height. Again, hard to study well, um, but the, the party line at this point is that if you take the medication starting at age seven or eight and continue into adolescence, uh, if you take a group of, say, 100 kids, on average, uh, the, the kids will be about half an inch to an inch shorter. Uh, and the, this seems to be a direct effect of the medication. This is not a result of like decreased appetite or, or decreased sleep might affect growth, but, but it seems to be a direct effect of the medication. Uh, there's a fair amount of, what? Um, I think just um, when you look at the system and growth hormone and things like that, the, so, so the medications work through dopamine and all the systems are connected, so it's probably dopamine somehow acting on growth hormone. So um, it, it gets a little more complex when you try to follow this too, because um, it seems like, like there's an initial delay and then there's a catching up. Uh, then some kids will catch up, but, but other kids don't. So that's where the individual variability comes up. So, so the MTA study, which I mentioned before, was, was a 14-month study. So, so they found that, uh, that there were a handful of kids that they actually we're looking at them and say, wow, it looks like this kid over the course, you know, if this kid were treated over the course of years, that 
these handful of kids might grow up to be five or six inches shorter than, than they would have been, and they actually stop the medication for, for ethical reasons. Um, but then th there are other folks. So Michael, Michael Phelps, Olympic swimmer, he's like 6'8". So, so he was treated with medications when he was a kid. And you know, maybe he would be 6'9 or something. But uh, <laughs> it, So usually you follow it. Um, another reason why I say it might be a direct effect is that uh, it seems to be mitigated by not taking the medication in the summer or not taking the medication on the weekends. That, again, there's a little more catching up when you don't take the medications. Oh, all right. A little better than last time. Okay. Uh, so anyways, manage the side effects. Uh, these are the more serious side effects um, so, uh, or more problematic side effects. So heart problems, that'd be very serious. So if there's any history of the kid having anything that resembles a heart problem or fam family history, you want to order an EKG all that. Um, ticks can be a complication or you may unmask ticks. Diversion of stimulants. So here we are on a college campus and it is becoming quite common on college campuses for students who don't have a prescription for stimulants to take stimulants and then folks who, um, who are prescribed medications, uh, kids, adults are often asked to give, buy, or sell. Uh, sell their medication. Uh, so you need to have a good plan for compliance. Uh, these are the medications. Actually, I wanted to jump ahead. So the non-stimulants aren't quite as effective, but they have different side effects. Um, this, the slides will be posted, so you'll see that, and again, the, in this estimate, the like these stimulants 0.95, and these other medications that have some kind of FDA approval have um, um, a lower effect size, and, and they also take longer to work. So these are not medications that you can just start or stop. Um, as far as the behavioral interventions, they're, they're mostly nonspecific, so just good parenting, good school, um, behavior programs. Th there is, looking at the um, uh, interventions to address the core ADHD symptoms, th this has been harder to get, or in the past, th there hasn't been as good research around this, but we're actually getting some very interesting studies now. So, so there are some approaches where uh, kids try to Folks are trying to teach the kids to, to practice and learn how to sustain attention. There are drills to uh, improve short-term memory or um, working memory. Um, and, and these haven't always generalized well. So you can do things in the lab, and, and they don't always generalize well to the classroom. But, but there, some of the studies um, or some of the approaches involve having the kid practice in the classroom to try to get better generalization. Um, a lot of these. Uh, drills look like video games. Yeah. I think people are uncomfortable with um, medications in kids. Some people are sometimes uncomfortable with video games in kids. Um, but, so I'll, I'll, I'll just present a study that was done, um, just published in the September, in a September issue of uh, the Nature Journal, or Nature Journal, the, the journal Nature. And this had to do with adults um, and trying to work on, on cognitive processing in adults. So they found a group of adults, actually, they, they tested adults all over the age range, but uh, they were targeting adults between the ages of 60 and 85, thinking, again, that they, they're going to be at risk for cognitive decline. And uh, they, they taught people a multitasking um, skill that involves something that looks a lot like a video game. And what they found was that um, this target group of adults that were 60 to 85 years old, once, once they practiced this, this multitasking drill, that uh, there were improvements in, in short-term memory and working memory. And they were actually able to perform as well as the 20-year-olds on, on the task. And that this uh, persisted for six months after, the, um, after they stopped the, the study. So, um, so, so this is happening with adults, and, and they're doing similar things with kids. So this, it, it's very preliminary, um, both in adults and kids. But it's, it's an area, I think, that, that we're going to see more more interventions uh, developed. So um, I want to talk about parent decision making because we, we have this uh, condition, ADHD, that's associated with these, these very negative outcomes, not always, but often associated with high risk of, of negative behaviors. And then we have these medications that are pretty effective. And yet, if you look at parents um, and what they decide to do, uh, most parents don't want their kids on medication. Um, by about two to one, this is true for ADHD, this is true for depression, about two to one, 
parents will want the kids to be off medication and will, will choose a behavioral intervention. Now, again, the, there are also parents and that would choose to be on medic, choose for the kid to be on medication and not to try the behavioral intervention. But, but most parents will choose no medication. Um, this is the MTA study looking at kids with ADHD, just, just to show the outcome. So the, the, the study had to do with the kids who had uh, got behavior treatment for 14 months, medication, aggressive medication treatment for 14 months, or combined behavior and medication treatment for 14 months. And you see again that there's some improvement. So the controls, about 25% didn't, were normal, didn't score in the clinical range on structured instruments. Uh, combined treatment was the best, but you see that medication management um, had better outcomes on this measure than behavioral treatment. Uh, but in looking at satisfaction, um, even though the outcomes weren't as good, the parents whose kids got behavior treatment, if you look at strongly satisfied or combined strongly satisfied with uh, satisfied, uh, folks are much happier with behavioral treatment even if the outcomes aren't as good. And I, I think we could talk about why that would be. What? But they're most satisfied. Yeah. yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> How different, that's sort of in the range, but and then when you combine the two, they're, they're pretty close. So um, again, this is more um, current research or more recent research looking at how do parents decide. So this is based on focus groups, um, so just getting together and um, doing focus group with, with kids um, and their parents. And so okay, we, we know that there's a lot of stress associated with having a kid with ADHD and that there are multiple factors and in fact kids um, with ADHD often start and stop medication. Um, th these are some of the factors that support the parent's decision to start medication. So recognizing that the kid is having problems, functional problems, um, seeing or believing that the medication will help. Um, a lot of parents uh, actually found the teacher feedback helpful in deciding to start the kid on medication. Um, of course, yeah, it's helpful to accept the diagnosis um, anecdotes, just, just reports from other people. Um, this actually worked both ways, that if, if you heard from someone that it was a bad idea to put your kid on medication, then of course parents would tend not to put the kid on medication, but um, if there was support for this and that this helped the parent to decide to put the kid on medication. Um, if you see ADHD as a chronic condition, and if you accept that it's a brain disorder, which again there's a lot of evidence for. Um, being aware of the long-term consequences. So again, these are things that, again, when I'm working with a parent, I tend to think of these things to, to try to help the parent to decide. Um, so that, that this is, uh, there can be a lot of bad outcomes if, if there's no treatment. Um, I think it's helpful just to think of a, a time-limited trial. So, so we're just gonna try this to see if it helps. If it helps, we'll continue, or consider continuing. If it doesn't help, then, then why would we continue? So just presenting it as a short-term trial, I think, is very helpful. Um, and then seeing it as an accepted treatment. As far as factors um, contributing to reluctance, I might guess the, the stigma. What? Okay. <laughs> so the stigma, just again, people just don't like medications in general for kids. Um, the idea that medication shouldn't be used to treat a behavior problem. Um, and concerns about side effects and personality changes. Okay. So, well, here are my slides on complementary and alternative medicine. I guess you can read that later. <laughs> so there's neurofeedback, food coloring, um, omega-3 fatty acids. Neurofeedback doesn't seem to generalize very well. Um, so this is the conclusion. Um, this is stuff we've talked about. So it's a chronic illness with Negative, income, uh, negative outcomes. Um, you need to get feedback from a lot of people before making the diagnosis. Um, if you use medication, it will help outcomes, but not make them completely well. Um, you can use medications or not if, this, if the symptoms are mild. Um, and we don't, stimulants for kids with ADHD don't clearly increase or decrease the risk of sub, future substance use. Okay, so. We're done. I guess we can take questions at this point. So, with your evidence-based child psychiatrist that you are, 
if a kid really did have ADHD and if they did have a positive response to medication, would your general recommendation to a family be just, well, your kid should stay on these medications indefinitely to have the best outcome? Um, I, I typically, so someone had the question, would the recommendation be to, to continue kids on medication um, for, for a long time? Uh, given what we know that some kids will grow out of it, I, I do recommend generally that um, uh, kids have a trial off medication about once a year um, d during the critical periods, which I would say the critical periods would be from between age, say, 7 and 10 or so, that, that there'll be a, a chunk of kids that grow out of it at that point. But if, if you still have the symptoms at age 10 or 11, you most likely will continue to have symptoms through puberty but, or into puberty. So puberty would be another time um, to try taking the kid off medication, and then a number of them will try going off anyways. Either the kid or the family or both will try to take the kid off sometime in the teens. Uh, and then another critical period would be in the 20s, where um, t typically um, uh, folks um, get more ma mature brain functioning at about age 25 or so. So that'd be another time to, to try to go off. Okay, so, so I would continue, but knowing that if, if you have it at certain ages, that you, you most likely will not go out of the symptoms at, at that point in your life. Yes. Um, I noticed that um, you mentioned about the dopamine and kind of skipped over the alternative. Um, my son really had severe problems, like severe anorexia. Growth was done at everything. So I started studying orthomolecular vitamin therapy. And I'm wondering what your knowledge is on GABA as far as like um, boosting the dopamine or if, it's, if you know of its use in ADHD because it's worked wonders with my son. Hmm. And we had to go that way because of severe, severe reactions on every different kind of ADHD medication. Mm -hmm. But what is your take on the natural approach? Yeah, um, so, so with GABA specifically, I, I have no knowledge of GABA. I've not used it myself. Um, I guess I would also say if, if it's worked well for you and your son, then that's great. I mean, that, uh -huh. yeah. Well, um, uh, folks are just starting to study GABA now, so I guess we'll see more about that. I mean, I guess the other thing just with, with child behavior in general, um, uh, we're talking about a, a very serious condition in ADHD. We don't have a lot of great answers. I mean, even with the best treatments, there, there's a risk for, for negative outcomes. So. I would really just say in general, try everything, try anything, and, try, and stick with whatever seems to work, but also test it from time to time to see if that's really what, what the critical factor is. Is that it? All right. Well, thank you very much for coming.